Hello, my name is Robert S. Kahn. Where and when were you born? Born down at Pine Level, Alabama, a little community located on Highway 231 south of Montgomery. And when were you born? July the 28th, 1922. I think I had a good childhood. We lived out on the farm. Had to do a little plowing and a little hoeing to raise raised our living. We lived off of the farm. And all during my young years, you know, like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, up to 15, and all, or actually up to 17 years old. Then I went in the CC camp at age 18. When I say CC, it's really three C's. They call it the three C's. Civilian Conservation Corps. And I was stationed at Dadeville, Alabama in a forestry camp. And I, it, I reached the rank of sergeant in there. I, I, I was a corporal first gas house clerk and all, then they put me in the charge of a tool house <clears throat> and give me a helper. And I, I was there and I got, I went on up to rank of sergeant. I was a <clears throat> church secretary and Baptist training union leader in the Baptist church at Mount Zion, which is right there on the Mount Zion Road where we lived. And that's just a little bit north of Pine Level, uh, probably about six or seven miles. And I went up there that night to open the doors for everybody to be there for service. It's six o'clock, so I got I got in the I got in the uh, car and turned the radio on. And when I turned the radio on, I heard about Pearl Harbor. It, it had already happened early that morning, but we didn't know it all day long. And then I just heard it that night, that night of uh, December 1941. What was that like as a young man to hear that your country had been attacked? And <laughs> I'll tell you what it was like. I. It was like I know that I was getting ready to have to go do some service somewhere because everybody had to. I knew the draft board already had you, you know, from the time you was 18, you already in a status because I was on a farm up there on a cattle ranch at that time doing work that they claimed was essential to the war effort. See, they already had a little war going on in different places where Hitler been trying to run over all them European nations. And he had took a bunch of them already down in 40 and 41, 42, and all that uh, campaign that went on down in Italy before I ever served over there in Europe when I went to France and Germany and Luxembourg and Belgium. I had been tough all the way for the last three years at the cattle ranch and then spent 17 weeks in Blanding, Florida, and I know then that I was ready for service over there. And once you get over there, this will take us away from basic training now and take you to the front line. Once you get there and get assigned, you know what you're going to do. The best thing that they told us to do was to keep on remembering our training. Keep that on your mind and do everything you can to follow the things that you've been taught. And so that, 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 that worked out for me because that's what I did. Every day I think about the way we were trained that night. There wasn't no getting no relief because they said you go forward. When you get in the army, you don't you don't you don't turn back in combat. You just look forward and keep pressing on. And so that's what we did. I never saw my company commander. Didn't know who he was. Never seen him. I spent one night on the machine gun with a second lieutenant. Me and him took over when I. Germans crawled up there under 
mortify. We was being mortared, and I was crouched down in my little half-dug foxhole. It wasn't deep enough, but I was crouched down in it to get through all that mortify. And when the mortify was over, we got up and went down there and looked. We was back up on the side of a hillside. The infantry was down there in front of us. They were right down in, there was going to be a little open valley down there right where the gun was set up. Of course, it was in a camouflage place, but the, but the ground was open out in front of it. And there lay two dead, the, the first gunner and the second gunner. German crawled up there and threw the concussion grenade in there and killed them. We knowed the ground. I felt the ground just bounce underneath me because I wasn't very far away. I'm going to say I was about as far away as for the screen door on my front porch out there. That's just about how far behind the gun that I was. So me and him kept a gun the rest of that night, me and that second lieutenant. And he told me then, he said, you replacement, said, you guys come in here as a replacement. He said, y'all way better soldiers than the ones we had. He said, y'all, y'all replacements must have had some real good training. I told him, I said, well, I know, I know what they told us to do. And I, I'm trying to do that to my best, best of my ability. I want to make sure that I follow my training. He said, well, you, you'll do well then if you do. And I never seen him no more after that night. I know it. I know without a doubt he must have got killed. I never seen. I never did see a squad leader. I never did see a platoon leader. I was on my own from that day forward. Uh, going back through that incident, you mentioned a German had come and killed the first and the second gunner mm-hmm. uh, of the machine gun. Later that night, I mean, did you have any experiences against the Germans yourself? Everything got quiet after then, but he, the one that threw that grenade in there, I didn't tell the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey said, this is the rest of the story. He kept laying out there, he, he, the mortifier got him on his way back when he went to go back. He got away from us, I was back for him, he had that barn yonder, and he, and, and he was hollering for a medic. And there's an old guy dug in right to the left of me, right over there, and he was all in a deep foxhole, 40 years old from Connecticut. And he'd been with them. He'd been, he said, I've been in this stuff ever since we come out of France. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll shut him up. So he had a grenade in himself, took him and threw it out there, and never did hear him no more. And the rest of that night was quiet. We, we left the next day at 12 o'clock. We pulled out there, and I know, we noticed a little sprig about the end of my finger right there. Knocked out the gun that we couldn't see it at night, but it, we didn't feel like it would have hurt it. If we'd have had to fire it, we could have fired it. I think it would have worked, but we asked for a new gun, ordered a new gun, and they brought us one. They brought us a new gun. We, we got into a situation on the front line about the second or third day that I was up there. There's just an old house there that done bummed it till it just a, more or less some walls standing up in a half, halfway shed over the top, but not much. We stopped and took up a little halting position and then let the signal corps come by and let them get all their messages out and all. We were just we were just in a holding position for a few minutes. And they 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 throw the bomb in there and the shrapnel eat the field jacket as though it eat it off my body. But I didn't have a scratch nowhere on my body. But it you 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 it would have been unbelievable to anybody's eyes that would have seen it. And then one boy from upstate New York behind us, his name was John. I can't remember his last name, but he was a very pleasant person to know and be around. He got hit hard on that, knocked a big hole in his shoulder and side and all part of his leg. He was hit. They just, I don't know, I, I don't see how he could live, but they got him. The medics picked him up and got him out, and we, we waved him goodbye when he left, but... He left in a bad shape. But that 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 shrapnel is a thing that's sort of like a puzzle. 
you can't understand how it works. It just could eat a man's jacket up and not put a scratch on him nowhere. I know that you ain't interviewed nobody probably that would tell you a story like this. Going down one day on an open field where it was, I'm going down that side to, to the right. We'll say it's out in front of us like this room and I'm going down the right hand side. Some more of the troops coming down the center and some more over on the left side. And the whole field out there is a battlefield to the front. Is a front line battle going on on across an open field and it's open. But there's woods over on my side to the right. There's some woods, pretty heavy. And we know to watch out for snipers. And I did watch out. And when I did, and I spotted one, I could have just shot him and killed him easy as pie. And I thought, well, he saw me. I know he saw me. I wonder why he didn't shoot me. Because I was running a little piece, drop down on the ground. Run a little piece, drop down on the ground. That's what you follow in your training in your order. But he must have been out of ammunition or either he just decided he didn't want to give away his position and he was waiting for the most perfect shot that he could get. He, he didn't shoot me, so <laughs> I give him that and went right on. And I didn't shoot him either. He, he didn't shoot me and I didn't shoot him. You gave him a thumbs up. I did and went right on. Sure did. Now somebody hear me say that, they say he, he, they say he ought to be put to death because he, he knowed better than to do that, which I did know better than to do it. But I did it anyway. It's a, that's an open, true confession. So I know this ain't going nowhere to do me no harm the rest of my life. And that's the reason I wanted to tell you about it. I, I appreciate you being so open uh, this I've had some real experiences in that man's army. I tell you, I really had some experiences. That I'm gonna tell you this one because this is a good one. We got off of that uh, ship, and they put us on a train. They put us on a train from New York to Atlanta. And when we arrived in Atlanta, it was on up. You know, I'm going to say 4.30. It was getting pretty close to pretty close to 5 o'clock, and I thought, well, I ain't got time to get a haircut. I needed a haircut, but I said, I'm going to take a chance on it. And so I run down there from the, from the train, from the train station down, to where I could get to a barber shop, somebody directed me where it was at, and I said, I'll go down there. And I jumped in the barber chair at about 4.30, I guess. And he was cutting my hair. Everything was normal, just like, just like it is, like we are right here now. Everything was fine. And lo and behold, they had a radio on. The radio was on playing. And they said, Japan surrendered. And we looked back to the left like that. By the time I looked over there, all the tall buildings, paper was flying out the windows, and people were running up and down the highway, and convertibles throwing up fifths of, uh, fifths of whiskey in the air. Atlanta went, Atlanta went crazy. And I, and I had to get out of that barber chair and walk back up there to that train. And I thought, sure, I might get killed. I did. I thought, well, I miss, I done made it through the war now and come home to get killed. Because everyone was... The whole city just went crazy. But I, I actually made it back to the train, believe it or not. I feel like with the Lord's help. That, uh, I ain't mentioned the Lord in his interview, but I want to mention him because that's one thing that war taught me, that God does answer prayer. And if you don't believe it, you better believe it. That's all I can say. If people don't believe that, they better believe it. He does answer prayer.